Today I wanted to just introduce Forrest Smith. Forrest is the director of South Texas Natives, a division of Cesar Kleberg Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. The purpose of South Texas Natives is to develop and promote native plants for restoration and uh, reclamation. And Forrest actually grew up near uh, Mullen, Texas. You'll have to get him to tell you where that is because I'm not completely sure. Uh, but he got a BS in Range and Wildlife Management from Texas A&M Kingsville back in 2003. Uh, he's actually been with South Texas Natives, though, since 2001 and has helped collect and organize over 1,800 native seed collections, evaluated over 40 seeds for commercialization, and he's been involved with 12 seed releases where most of those he either authored or co-authored. He's an active photographer. He's authored numerous publications, served on several statewide boards, and has been recognized by professional organizations. Don't let his age fool you. He's very accomplished and knowledgeable, and I'm really pleased that we could get him here today uh, to speak to us about advancements in native grassland restoration in Texas. Forrest? Thank you, Megan. Uh, can everybody hear me here and not on okay? Uh, Megan's introduction reminds me I need to update my bio because I, it's a little old and I'm going to contradict some of her statements. Uh, but I'm right and she's wrong. So uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to talk about uh, what I really find interesting and enjoy doing, and that's native grassland restoration, native plant restoration. Um, I've had the good fortune to work for a program called South Texas Natives since its inception in 2001. And South Texas Natives is, at its heart, a landowner-driven initiative. Uh, the program came about in, in 2001 and, and was dreamed up, I guess, by landowners even before that in response to a lack of, of uh, commercial availability of native seeds. Landowners wanted those native seeds so that they could restore old pastures, degraded rangelands, uh, roadsides, things like that, using native plants. Uh, and their desire to use native plants was a result of, of a shift on their ranch lands and range lands towards a greater awareness of the importance of wildlife, both from a recreational and conservation standpoint, but also from the standpoint of economics. Uh, there's South Texas ranches, particularly in the, the sand sheet area of South Texas, that are getting 20 to $25 an acre for, for quail leases. And it's widely known and, and widely proven now that, that quail do best in native grasslands, and you know while while a rancher can get that twenty to twenty five dollars an acre for for quail hunting year in year out, uh, irrespective of a drought, even uh, they're hard pressed to lease some of that country for livestock grazing for five and six dollars an acre. So there's some real economics behind this. Uh, luckily, a lot of these landowners are, are strong conservation advocates and have donated enormously to our program. And then building that program with private dollars has, has built the infrastructure and, and put the personnel in place then to go out and get state and federal research grants uh, and partner with agencies with similar needs. And the Texas Department of Transportation is one of our primary research partners and in essence is one of the largest buyers of native seed in the state of Texas. And so they have a a great interest in this work is also. My official title, uh, as of about a month ago, is the Dan L. Duncan Endowed Director of South Texas Natives in our uh, newer project, Texas Native Seeds. Uh, the Duncan family uh, is very generous in, in giving our project that endowment, and it represents the first uh, stable funding source that our program's had in, in its 12-year history. Uh, the Duncans are the owners of Enterprise Pipeline Company, and so another they represent another industry who who heavily uses restoration and reclamation technology and, and native seeds in their work. Now, I want to start before I get into some of the things that we've learned trying to do grassland restoration uh, with kind of a, an overview of our basic process. Uh, Megan said. 
one of our, our goals is to develop and promote native seeds. And, and I kind of frame the fact that in 2001, there were no native seeds available. And so our main role is to develop mass quantity, uh, large scale sources of native seeds. And, and we do that with a, basically a standard scientific process that's used in, in forage seed production and in pasture grass seed production uh, and throughout agronomy over the past hundred years, but it, it's a process that to help provide a end users with a, a tested product in native seeds um, and a product that, that is available in the quantities that consumers need. Uh, throughout South Texas today, there's probably upwards of 25,000 acres that are disturbed in a way such that they should be reseeded to, to put native plants back on those places. And so in our environment, particularly going out and wild harvesting a prairie uh, is not really feasible to do. For one, there's only two years out of 10 that those wild prairies produce viable seed because of our rainfall regime here. Uh, our added problem in, in South Texas is that many of those native prairies are invaded, interspersed, whatever term you want to use, by an introduced plant of one sort or another. And cleaning those introduced plant seeds out of native grass seeds is virtually impossible to do. And so we, we take an agronomic approach where we develop these seed sources to be grown in a, and oftentimes in a row crop setting under intensive inputs, intensive irrigation, to provide a seed source year in, year out to meet that, that big need that's out there. So the, the process of developing a native plant seed source starts in those native habitats. This is a probably the, the best example of a, a natural native grassland I know of in South Texas from Kennedy, Kennedy County, uh, south of Sarita. Uh, that's a true South Texas tall grass prairie. And those people collecting are, are standing in big blue stem over eight feet tall uh, on a native grassland. There's not much of our region that looks like that anymore. Uh, but that's, that's what a lot of it looked like probably prior to the 1800s. By, by as early as the 1800s, many of those areas had been grazed pretty intensively. But it's a good place to go back to at this point in time and, and collect seeds of material that you know has been in this environment for centuries, uh, is very well adapted to it, uh, and material to use for developing a seed source. So after we collect material from all over, we start a, a scientific evaluation of that material. Basically, we're, we're comparing different populations of that plant. Now, our goal is not to, to take the available genetics and change them or breed those plants. Our goal is to find amongst that, that regional population of that plant a, a population or a type that has the traits you need for, to be successful in restoration and in commercial seed production. And those traits often center on, on things like seedling emergence, uh, seed yield capability, um, long-term survival, those types of things. So we, that evaluation process typically will take from two to as long as seven years, depending on the, the complexity of the species and, and our ability to find what we would frame as suitable material. Uh, when we say suitable, we tend to qualify that as a plant that will, will allow the end user to meet basically your common restoration metrics. We also define success as it's something that if we send to the commercial seed market, can they reasonably produce it and make a profit with it? If so, then it's a, it's a good selection. So after we pick the winners, so to speak, and to, to kind of summarize the evaluation part, then we go into a seed increase phase. If you go to a commercial seed grower and you tell him, I've got a handful of this selection of seed and I want you to grow 10,000 pounds of it, He's, he's probably going to laugh at you or, or he may say, well, uh, okay, I'll have your 10,000 pounds of seed in 15 years because he doesn't have the time to dedicate 
towards that increase uh, the way maybe that we would. And so we do that initial seed increase. And we found that typically on a, on a seed release, you know, something between 10 and 25 acres worth of production usually gets those commercial growers' attention more so than a few ounces of seed will. And so we, we try to increase those selections up to that, not that point. Uh, that way we have a, a reasonable quantity of seed to provide to them where they can get a product to market quickly. And after we've increased the seed, then we go through a release process where we we and our collaborators, uh, through a peer review process, uh, review all the information that, that justified that release, uh, test that material extensively so that we have a good, good idea that it will be successful, and, and then we release these native plant seed sources. And those, those releases, most of them are a cooperative release from Texas AgriLife, uh, the Caesar Clayburgh Institute, and then also the USDA Plant Materials Center in, in Kingsville. So the, I think Megan, when she read, said there were 13 releases. We're up to 21 releases right now for South Texas. And those include everything from, you know, what you think of your more common grasses like Arizona cottontop, side oats grama, pink pappas grass. But also we, we work pretty extensively on, on many different legumes, uh, forbs, both perennial and annual forbs. Uh, with the idea that we want to be able to provide consumers diverse seed mixes. Uh, we all know that, that native habitats are typically characterized by diversity, and that's especially true in South Texas. And so if you go out there and you try to restore a habitat for wildlife or a native grassland, and all you plant is side oats grama, oftentimes you're not all that successful doing that because you're skipping the processes of succession and, and dynamic plant change within those communities. And so instead, it's usually better to start with a portion of your mix being annual forbs. Uh, if you need to plant in the winter, you obviously need some cool season plants in there. But the idea then of, of through restoration, you're, you're establishing diversity and resiliency in our environment. And, also, diversity in, in these restoration mixes tends to promote success. So I think today of those 21 seed releases, I believe 18 of them are commercially available. Uh, in the last year, there was enough seed. This is, this is hard to put words on. There was there's basically 20,000 acres of planting seeds sold. The amount of seeds sold commercially would, was enough to plant about 20,000 acres out there on the land. And uh, we have a good idea through our relationship with, with the growers and through some licensing agreements, a good idea of where most of that seed is going right now. And it, it tends to be for reclamation. And reclamation associated with oil and gas activity is a, a big part of the puzzle right now. But there's also an increasing amount going into to other uses like rangeland restoration, uh, big uses such as along the levees in the Rio Grande Valley when they're disturbed, uh, really a, a real broad segment of, of people that utilize these seeds. So the real, you know, the real end point of this, of the process, is, is testing it and seeing if it works. And, you know, that, that picture on the screen now is, is basically representative of a, a pretty degraded rangeland site in Duval County. Uh, that picture was taken in, in the summer of 2008, uh, which was a fairly, fairly wet period. Uh, you can see the tractor on the left-hand side of the screen uh, planting these seeds in 2008. This picture is in 2010, I believe June. Uh, with, as you can see, a mixture of native plants reestablished to that side and, and doing well. Uh, so that, that's kind of our, our main goal, is to be able to take things like that bare ground picture and reestablish a, a native plant community that can support wildlife, livestock, uh, conservation, you know, water cycles, those things. So now, I've kind of gone through some of the basic stuff. 
uh, kind of outlined what we do. Now I want to go over kind of a synopsis of, of some of the things we've learned and, and then also things that, that people, particularly uh, extension agents, can keep in mind as they talk to people uh, out on the land who may be considering native seeds or, or getting conflicting information about, well, which, which native seeds should I buy? Should I buy the ones from a seed dealer in the Panhandle or should I buy the ones from a seed dealer in San Antonio? What's the difference? Uh, why we say to, to recommend using the seeds we've developed, for the most part, they're the only native seeds on the market that are truly adapted to South Texas that truly originate from material that was growing wild, growing native in this region. So all of our seed releases to date originate from, from one of three eco-regions or a combination of each in some releases. But, so if you're, you're doing restoration work using native seeds, uh, unless you're planting these seed sources, what you're using, it may work uh, somewhat, it may fail totally, but if you're using seeds from elsewhere, uh, they tend to be less successful. And that's simply because genetically they're not adapted to this region. Uh, a lot of the seed that's on the commercial market comes from Kansas, Nebraska, north central Texas, or even further away. And, and typically those plants are just not well adapted to our climate. And that was the whole basis behind our our program. Our releases also give the landowner, the, the person planning, some options that are early, mid, and late successional types of plants. A lot of the traditional native seed material on the market is centered on the late successional species only. Things like little blue stem, big blue stem, which are tremendous plants and very important. They don't grow in your quintessential restoration environment, though, very well. Uh, your typical area you're looking to conduct restoration on is, for lack of a better word, pretty messed up. And a lot of those late successional, late serial, climax species are not well adapted to thrive and, and colonize those disturbed environments. Typically early and mid-successional plants, or weedy plants, if, if you want, uh, work best to revegetate a, a disturbed site. Also, when you use native seeds, you have options of, of grasses, forbs, legumes. Uh, typically, in, if you're considering introduced species, introduced grasses are your main thing that's available, particularly for rangeland seeding. Uh, and there's also not a whole lot of, of forb and legume options that, that will persist long term in many areas. Also, when you're using natives, there's cool and warm season plant options. Um, obviously, in grasses, we have a release of Canada wild rye, which is a real productive cool season plant, and many warm season grasses. You know, the main reason is you can know that, that these seed sources have been extensively tested throughout this region, uh, and they will perform well. If you buy an un unnamed variety of native seed that's just sold to you as little blue stem, uh, it's hard to know if you have a reasonable chance of success. But if you buy the little blue stem that we're fixing to release, that, that we're going to name Carrizo germplasm, you're going to know that that seed has been tested throughout the region, that it comes from South Texas, and that there's a, a pretty reasonable chance of, of getting a good product. Our seed sources are only sold, when they're sold by the variety name, they have to be grown as certified seed. And, and what that does is it, it ensures that there's oversight of the commercial production of those seeds. Uh, it's basically a quality control and consumer protection issue. When those, those plants are produced under those guidelines, there's production standards, uh, seed cleanliness standards, and, and also that guarantee of, of progeny or, or origin, origin of those, those seeds in the bag. Uh, that's important, particularly the cleanliness standards. Uh, a lot of times people that are wanting to plant and promote native plants absolutely don't want introduced plants, uh, either from a concerns of of productivity for wildlife or concerns about spread or invasion. 
when you buy a lot of the native seeds on the market, you're not assured that there's not also some, say, old world blue stem or Bermuda grass mixed in that bag. Uh, it could be, and it's simply an, an other crop seed. But on our releases, kind of with the awareness that, that most of the consumers of these seeds want only native native plant material, uh, we've set up the releases such that that most of those introduced plants are, are prohibited. I've kind of already gone over this, but you know, why, why if you have somebody uh, that comes into your office and says, I, I need to do range restoration, would you, you recommend to them to use native seeds? Uh, if they're a wildlife-oriented ranch or rancher, uh, with the research information we have available, uh, natives are a pretty clear choice in that regard. Uh, and it makes sense. Native wildlife is, is adapted to and thrives best in, in native grassland or native habitat situations. There's also some property value things that I, I think are being paid attention to more and more, uh, particularly in the drought. Uh, the drought that we're in and have been through Obviously, the livestock production uh, returns on a lot of rangelands are, are falling through the floor. They're, they've been liquidated, and, and realistically, it may be years before livestock are, again, part of the value of that property. There's probably been very few ranches bought in the last maybe decade, but certainly the last few years, uh, bought principally for livestock production. There are some, of course, but Primarily, rural land values are being driven by, by wildlife habitat value, recreational value, uh, and basically value for, for honey. And so long term, uh, I guess it's anybody's guess, but, but a lot of us think the trend will be that exotic pasture land perhaps won't be as valuable on the real estate market as good wildlife habitat or good recreational property. There's also a property value thing there where there's, there's areas of abandoned cropland uh, that are essentially serving very, very little uses now where that if native plants and native grasslands are restored, uh, property values can certainly increase. And we've, we've seen and, and documented some examples of that. Uh, in Kingsville locally. The, the big one when it comes down to a choice of should I use native plants for restoration or should I plant exotic grasses, uh, using those exotic grasses with what we know now is, is almost a permanent decision. You, you've dedicated that land to exotic grass use unless you were to take it back to a point and farm it and clean it up. Uh, so it's a, you know, like we say sometimes a legacy decision whether as to what you plant. So I want to go over and give some examples of, of some of the uses of native seeds and, and native plant restoration techniques. Uh, we, we break most of the uses into four categories. Uh, first one being your typical rangeland restoration. In South Texas, that's very often associated with, with mechanical brush control. Uh, often, you know, through century, a century or more of overgrazing, you have a, a fairly depleted seed bank in areas or uh, an area where the landowner is interested in, in recovering ground cover, or forage resources, quail nesting habitat faster than might happen should you not see. And so, this is probably, you know, I would say right now, the second most prevalent use of, of these grasses. Uh, there's also a lot of concerns recently because of the drought conditions, uh, areas that have been had severe loss of, of existing bunch grasses and, and people that want to jumpstart the process back to, to better conditions. So each of these pictures I'm going to show are pictures that I've had sent to me by landowners who've, who've done projects with these seeds. So this was a, a planting in uh, Maverick County. It was done in 2009 and about a year later, the results from it. Another big use and probably going to be a bigger use if, if 
droughts continue and water, as water restrictions become more common, there's a fair amount of cropland that's being taken out of, of irrigated or even non-irrigated crop production and converted back to grassland. And many times those, those landowners are, are wanting to convert back to native grasslands. And so this is an example of a, about 150 acre planting that was done near Uvalde by a landowner. Uh, basically his water has become too valuable to farm with and so he is he's going to convert the formerly irrigated cropland he had to native grassland to, to hopefully graze cattle on and or lease for, for quail hunting. There's also a fair amount of, of introduced grass pasture conversion back to native grassland. There's obviously the, the change in, in goals of land ownership and change in ownership of properties. There's a lot of, of say, buffalo grass, Bermuda grass, other, other introduced pastures uh, that folks have an eye on converting to native grassland. And this was a, a really successful trial in LaSalle County uh, in that area, you know, great diverse native habitat, grasses, forbs, shrubs growing in it now. About two years prior to that, it was 99% cover stand of buffalo grass. And so that's, it doesn't always work that way, but, but this particular project was very successful. And the other Another big use and you know, big need there is for these, need, these seeds is, is reclamation. Uh, obviously, ever, the Eagle Ford shell is a, a household term now. Um, everybody knows it. Everybody knows the scale of, of what's happening in that area. And obviously, it has some impacts on rangelands and ranching, uh, just from a sheer land use and land disturbance magnitude. Uh, this picture is a pipeline right of way that was reseeded using these native grasses, uh, and that this one is in uh, Live Oak County. So when you consider using native seeds and, and trying to attempt native grassland restoration, I want to go through some of the, I guess what I, we would call the, the commonalities of success after doing and being involved in you know, probably literally hundreds of these projects over the years, uh, certain things have come to the top and, and looking at results and data that, that correlate with success. And, and one of those that, that's often overlooked, I would say, is the need to use site-specific native, seed, native seeds for each site. We get caught in the trap of saying, Big blue stem is native to South Texas, so you plant big blue stem everywhere. Well, the first part of that is true. Big blue stem is native to South Texas. Uh, the second part, it only grows in about four distinct soil types in five or six counties of South Texas. And so it's a native grass, and yes, it's native to the region, but it's not appropriate for everywhere in that region. Um, locally here in, in Corpus, what you would plant on the clay soils uh, here around the center versus what you might plant on a sandy loam soil 20 miles away would be very different things, very different seed mixes. And so the, the best guidance to determine which of those plant species is best for your site is the, the NRCS ecological site descriptions. They're, no, they're not perfect. They're not you know, sub-meter accurate when you look at a GPS coordinate versus the, the soil map and the ESD, but they're the best resource we have right now to, to try to get that right. The other uh, good option when it's available is, is, of course, to visit native sites on the same soil nearby the sites you want to plant and, and match the two up with species. Another commonality of, of success is, is that good seed beds result in, in successful plantings. And, and to people that have a, a farming background, that's, that's no revelation. But a, a lot of times wildlife and rangeland managers aren't, aren't maybe as knowledgeable about the importance of, of preparing a good seed bed. But 
you know, basically a firm, well-worked seedbed is best. Uh, it's very, very important when using these native seeds to try to control or su suppress the existing seed bank of competitive plants, which typically the most problematic ones for restoration are exotic grasses. You've got to suppress that seed bank before planting, if at all possible. And one of the main reasons for that is that with, with native plants, and particularly if you're planting a mix of grasses and forbs and legumes, you have very few selective herbicide options on the table after planting. So you want, it, you want it to be as clean and weed free up front as, as is possible. Another important part of, of successful grassland restoration if you're planting seed is, is to use the right planting method and right equipment. In general, uh, native seed drills, grass drills that have multiple seed boxes that allow you to plant several different types or sizes of seed simultaneously will be the most successful technique. Uh, another very important part of doing this is that you need to calibrate that equipment for the exact seed mix being used. Every, every native seed mix you buy, if you buy the same mix two years in a row, uh, your drill needs to be recalibrated in between. That's because purity, uh, PLS of those seed lots is going to vary lots a lot. Another, another important thing to, to keep in mind and, and even advise people who are interested in, in native seeding of is, is that establishment of, of native seeds is generally a, a six month to two year process. Uh, these seeds are not sorghum seeds. They don't get in the ground and with minimal moisture, you know, in a certain number of days pop up. A lot of these seeds have an inherent dormancy uh, or very specific emergence requirements. Those emergence requirements may only occur once in two years. And so it takes time generally for a mixture of these things to all germinate and establish. Uh, Generally, if, if these are the type plantings that are going to be done in an area where uh, livestock are going to be part of the picture, uh, near complete deferral for two years is, is generally a good starting point. With a, above average rainfall, that, that deferral period might be much less, but it, it takes some time for these plants to reestablish. And, and really, that's, that's a known. Uh, native rangelands that are severely beat up generally take two or three years to recover to a point where, where they can be grazed well also. Another thing we've learned, particularly in the last three years, is that these super dry, droughty conditions we've had are not the end of the world and, and you know, are not at all negative when it comes to establishing some of these native plants. And the reason for that is these drier, uh, obviously hotter periods we've had, a lot of these native grasses seem to be very well adapted to those conditions and, and may have somewhat of a competitive advantage in those conditions over, say, a grass like buffalo grass that, uh, you know, rainfall's been pretty minimal for it lately. So as a as a person advising consumers, or, or if you are a consumer, some of the things to consider when you, you start to move into wanting to do a native seeding project is to remember that the, the native seed market is volatile. It's a market where demand may be through the roof one year. Uh, next year, if it's really dry across the region, uh, it's a pretty slow market. But right now, demand is very high, you know, primarily because of the Eagleford shell. And so if you want to get a hold of native seeds and make sure they're available for a project, ordering early uh, is a good idea. If you have an especially large seed need, say a thousand acre type project, uh, communicating that kind of need six months in advance of when you need delivery would be a good idea. Seed cost is also a, you know, part of this and, and goes into a lot of people's decision making process. Just in general, native seeds are going to cost more than exotics, and that's, that's a simple production reality. 
a lot of these native plants are harder to grow uh, and harder to produce seed of successfully than, than exotic grasses are. The exotic plants uh, also cost a lot more today than they did 15 and 20 years ago. And so there's not a, not a huge spread, but there is a difference. Another thing to keep in mind is that a, a small batch, say a 10 acre mix of native seed is generally going to cost quite a bit more than a large order of, of say for 100 acres. That's because each mix that's tailored to each site has to be mixed and, and separated out by that seed company. So seed cost is, is I think, someday probably not going to be uh, much of an issue. I, I think eventually as, as some of the large seed consumers, folks like Textod and, and the NRCS, if, as they start planting natives more and more and, and production gets even higher than it is today, the cost will continue to go down. Just some comparative costs to kind of show you where things sit today. I, I pulled these prices off of a list last week. You know, your, your standard rangeland seeding product of common buffalo grass is the recommended rates about $20 an acre. Some of the improved buffalo grasses like Laredo buffalo grass, uh, 108 an acre and on down. And then at the, the bottom, those are native grass releases that, that we've helped develop uh, in the price per acre if you're just planting those. So you can see you know, there's, there's some that are higher, some that are lower. But if you use the standard of, say, climb grass or buffalo grass, it is substantially cheaper than, than most native grasses. Here's some actual cost data from actual mixes that, that I was, saw invoices for last year, uh, in various uses. Uh, you can see the price varying from 60 an acre up to 115 an acre. And that's, that's generally the range you're going to be in. I would say, you know, for a, a larger project, and I'll qualify larger as, as a 500 acre or more project, that $60 an acre figure is probably reasonable. If you're doing a really small spot, like a tank dam, you know, that mix is typically going to cost you a little more, just because there's more uh, labor going into mixing that one batch of seed. But it also depends on which plants are, are in the mix. Uh, I calculated this uh, last week also based on, on current prices, what, what I would call a, a pretty solid, good native grass seed mix for a sandy loam soil in South Texas, uh, $79 an acre is what you're looking at today. So I want to shift gears a little bit and, and move into, I guess, more along the lines of of what the title of the presentation was about, uh, give a, a few research results and, and findings we've had from, from experimental plantings and trials uh, that we've done across South Texas that uh, are geared at certain uses. And one of those uses is, is the Eagle Ford and, and for oil field restoration. That's probably, you know, for the next 15 years, it, it looks like going to be the, the major use of of native seeds and restoration, and, and I know it's something that a lot of our phones ring about often. Here's uh, some pictures of some plantings that were done last fall that were sent to me a few days ago uh, on a big pipeline right away in, in LaSalle County showing native grasses uh, coming up. You can see the, the drill rows uh, from those plantings, and, and again, that's that particular section right away is 10 miles long, so you can visualize how much grass seed that, that had to take. First question I, I usually get from people that want to plant native seeds in, a, in an oil field setting is, is what's the best way to plant it? Uh, typically, because of cost, broadcast seeding is the first option that's, that's offered to people. Uh, but we tend to say drill seeding is best, and then you have other researchers and contractors that they want to use hydro seeding. And nobody had ever looked at these native seeds one-on-one -on -one in each of those uh, planting methods 
at, at multiple sites. And so in the last year we, we started a study to do that in on actual pipeline right of ways, one in Live Oak County, one in LaSalle County, and we did kind of a simulated uh, replicate of that in Kingsville uh, where we could irrigate it in case the other ones were, were limited by drought. You know, and I think going in, our hypothesis was that drill seeding would be superior. Nearly everyone that's dealt with, with rangeland seeding has been taught that. Uh, so we, we compared them, and, and basically what we found on those three sites in 2012, all three methods were very comparable in success. Uh, we had similar stands at six months, and, and now at a, more than a year after seeding, those stands are, are very successful uh, still. So, you know, we, we didn't find the data that said drill seeding was, was far superior to broadcast seeding. Uh, from a cost standpoint, hydro seeding was very successful, but it's also a very expensive planning process. And so uh, drill and broadcast seeding appear to be good methods to look at. We did find in, in a few replicates uh, that a lot of the highly erodible soils and, and or saline and alkaline soils we had a lot higher success with hydro seeding. So that those may, there may be special scenarios that really uh, are really serve best by something like hydro seeding. And, and one example of that, something you see if you've been in the Eagleford or these these frack tanks or, or water holding structures that are built. Uh, they have real steep sides. Typically, the, the soil that ends up on the, the uh, edge of, of those dams is the last thing out of the hole, which is not very good soil. It tends to be saline or high calcium in it. Hydro seeding appears to, to work best in those scenarios. Here's one example of that. You can roughly see uh, from the front of the picture going to the back, uh, a rectangle. And to the sides of that are, are more bare ground. And you can even see how slick and shiny the soil on the right side is. This was a, a site where numerous pipelines were put into the same right of way in a, in a saline clay soil. And the areas that we, we tried to plant by broadcasting or drill seeding were not very successful. Um, Whereas the area that we hydro seeded, which is basically what's shown here, uh, was very successful. So just that mulch layer in those saline soils allowed those grasses to get established and, and revegetate a site. Another thing we've, we've studied quite a bit is what's the best type of seed mix for a lot of these, these oil field <coughs> type environments. Uh, typically you're dealing with a, a very disturbed piece of ground, um, oftentimes subject to a lot of compaction, uh, may or may not have much erosion control uh, there. So our goal has always been that, that getting very fast, uh, resilient, early successional plant cover is, is pretty important. That lessens the impacts of soil erosion and or leaving a site uncovered such that you get weedy plants or, or unwanted introduced plants on it. And basically the way we've screened this is to, to do mixes on various sites with equal percentages of, of a number of plants in it and, and go back and record the, the figure out the ones that have done the best. And, and something that we've teased out of that is that windmill grasses and many of the, the native grama grasses uh, seem to be the, the best early colonizers of a lot of these really disturbed sites. And, and that's probably because those are grasses that often aren't mycorrhizal fungi dependent. And so you've got a site that, that the biotic community of the soil has been lost. A lot of your late cereal and climax grass species need to be able to germinate and associate with some of those, those fungi and, and things in the soil, whereas these grasses can grow without those, those soil communities established yet. But even still, with those being good performers, diversity is, is very important 
and when you think about South Texas and you think about the soil diversity we have, if you have a 10 mile long pipeline corridor, you're obviously going to cross more than one soil type. And so having a diverse mix is a good way to cope with that. And then also emergence conditions vary greatly. Um, you, if you put all your eggs in one basket, there's a, a high likelihood of failure. But we kind of have gone to recommending that on a, on a pipeline type planning or a, an oil fill restoration planning, if you can get an equal percent composition of your seed mix of, of 10 adapted plants, uh, that's a good starting point, we think, and a good, good shell to design a, a native restoration mix under. Another big question uh, in oil field work right now is how to handle topsoil. Uh, there's kind of a standard, standard practice of scraping topsoil off of things like a pad location and storing it uh, to protect it, protect it from spills, protect it from compaction. Uh, there's not been a lot of research to to kind of guide that process. And so some of the things we don't know is how deep to sal salvage soil, uh, what's the best way to store it, what do you, how do you store it and protect it so that you still have a, a viable seed bank in it 20 years from now when you go to put it back on that site. And so we're, we're doing some research uh, funded by the Houston Advanced Research Council on that topic right now. And we don't, don't have any findings yet, but you know, I think based on what, what we're looking at and what people do currently, I would say current recommendations are to, the, the big thing when dealing with soils is not to mix soil layers, to separate topsoil and subsoil if they're removed from a site. Um, if you can salvage the seed bank in the, what you call the biotic zone of the soil, uh, that's an area that has, you know, many, many hundreds of dollars worth of seed in it, it's already there. And so if you can, can salvage that to put back on a restoration site later, it's going to help you. Uh, and then to prevent erosion and prevent other plants from growing on those piles and, and maybe contaminating that seed bank in the pile, if you can temporarily revegetate the pile with, with native plants. Another biggie in South Texas, and I don't, I don't have the number in front of me right now, but it, it's uh, in the hundreds of thousands of how many old pad sites there are in South Texas, and then depending on who you talk to, there may be 70 to 100,000 Eagle Ford pad sites coming in our future. And so what to do with those once production's done uh, is, is a big topic and will probably be an even bigger topic down the road. But, we went through a process of, of studying how to do this with ExxonMobil and, and King Ranch's support where that we, we basically followed their standard process and then plugged in native seeds and, and have evaluated the performance of, of, of this restoration process for a couple of years. And really surprisingly, being that these were very old pad sites and, and areas that were drilled in a time where awareness of the environment it wasn't as high as it is now, we were pleasantly surprised by the, the good success we had on these sites. And the process that was followed there was some extensive soil testing to, to rule out soil problems. Uh, then we did surveys in the surrounding areas of the pads that we revegetated re to identify which were the right native plant species to plant in that area, and then they were, Fleachy was removed uh, to try to alleviate soil compaction. They were deep ripped and then double disc. Uh, we followed that with a weed spraying planted. Uh, we had ex some small enclosures on these sites to kind of look at the impact of grazing uh, in it. Uh, Grazing had a great impact. Uh, if possible, in, in pad site restoration and or any, any restoration, if, if it's possible to exclude cattle for the initial two years, it, it will certainly help. And, and you can see looking down those lines, 
On the left of each of those pictures was inside the exposure. On the, on the right side, cattle had access to it. And I'll qualify that a little bit with that these were done in 2011 through 2012. So the, it's pretty, pretty rough times in that area if you, you did these type of small plantings in a, in a large pasture during a rainier year, the impact of grazing might not be as, as severe, but it's, it's something to think of when you do that, that kind of work. There's another picture of, of you know, basically probably 12 to 15 native grasses uh, growing on a, on a spot that about a year before that picture was a caliche uh, pad site. So it's a good, good thing to realize is that these, a lot of these sites that we're seeing now can be fixed and taken back to really productive rangeland eventually. And there's another one on a, a little different soil type. I'm going to get towards wrapping up um, the me talking part of this, and I want to leave time for questions if anybody has any, but kind of leading into that, we do what we call our, our demonstration plantings throughout South Texas, and we've, we've got about 40 of these sites uh, installed that we monitor twice a year, uh, some going back as old as, as five and six years old now, and, and I want to make sure everybody knows that we we basically treat those sites as teaching tools, and, and I want extension agents and, and natural resources people to always know that if, if you have somebody interested in native grassland restoration or just seeing the performance of these seed sources in your area, uh, give us a call and, and let us try to schedule something where we can get you out there to one of these planting sites uh, to show you. You know, we can throw numbers at you and pictures all day, but a lot of people want to want to see it with their own eyes. And so it's a map of, of the current locations that we have out there. And you know, some some are successful, some haven't been. We have about a 60 to 70% success rate with rangeland type plantings of our seed. And so that's an option that's available. We're working on some some newer stuff, uh, we finally released a lot of the better native forage species. And there's obviously some interest in, in doing pasture plantings of mixes of those, those better native forages. And so that's something that, that we're anxious to work on and, and starting to work on a little bit. We're also continuing to make new South Texas seed source releases uh, with kind of an emphasis now on, on forbs and lagoons but also on early successional grasses, just because those have proven to be such, uh, such successful plants in, in restoration activities. And then our larger project that I really haven't uh, talked about today, but we're, we're leading a project called Texas Native Seeds. Uh, it's basically a, a extension or, or copy of South Texas Natives that's working in central and western Texas. In our, our process there is basically back in that collection phase. Uh, over the next decade or so, we'll begin releasing uh, regional seed selections of native plants for those regions. Last, before I take questions, um, how we can help you. Um, our website is it's hopefully full of good information on seed mix suggestions. Uh, we have kind of a, an interactive map on there that that lets you choose your location, uh, soil type, and then it will generate a, a recommended seed mix based on what's available at the time. And there's also information about all of the 21 releases we've made, including brochures, uh, planning information, vendor information, uh, and then also a section with information and, and good pictures about the common native plants that people occur, incur and and that they want to work with. We're also available to help provide <coughs> planting mix recommendations. Uh, you know, help you with, with where to get seed, uh, let you know what's available or not. Uh, the one thing we do ask, being that we get a lot of those requests, is, is if you can, 
provide us a GPS coordinate or a soil series name and your, your goals, background info about the site when you contact us. That, that makes the process a lot easier. Uh, from the GPS coordinate, we're able to look at what are similar research plantings we've done nearby or on the same soil and then give you the most informed recommendation. We're always glad to help with that. So I think that's uh, all the slides I had, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Keep in mind this question is from a from my chat so with friends who are green scientists, okay? So sure. you one of your slides is a, is a uh, control existing scene case before planting. Right. I mean I remember talking to green scientists that that's a ten year process. It? it can be. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and to repeat the question, uh, kind of asking about controlling an existing seed bank, uh, how difficult that would be and that it could be a 10-year process. And it, it may be a process you can never totally do. Um, what, what we try to tell people, uh, particularly when you deal with a site that used to have introduced perennial grasses on it, uh, many of those perennial introduced forage grasses have a very rapidly germinating seed. Some of them may not have seed that lasts that long in the seed bank. And so it's something that, that we've been able to do with uh, buffalo grass, for example. Uh, in about a three-year period, have virtually exhausted the seed bank right at the soil surface. Now, you know, obviously, every situation, that's not going to be something that you can, you can do. And you're not going to eliminate all the competition by any means. If you do nothing and plant right away, or that you have a, a large seed bank of one of these introduced perennial grasses, you'll fail nearly every time if you just go put native seed out there with that. It generally takes some effort to, to reduce that, that seed bank. Yes, the uh, the question was in the Eagleford Shell, who who does the actual restoration work? Was it companies, uh, oil and gas companies, contractors, landowners? It's some of each, really. Uh, and I don't even know what I would call a typical scenario because it's it's property by property. You know, each each agreement is is different. I would say the majority is probably done by vegetation contractors that are hired by oil and gas companies. Um, there's also a growing number of landowners who, who realize that they, they'll probably do a better job on their property than a contractor would, and so they're, they're tending to, to just ask for a payment for those damages, and then they, they do the work themselves or they subcontract it out. Uh, but there are some really good contractors out there that know have the right equipment to work with these seeds and, and have experience with them. Right. They, you know, they're uh, they're in many cases people that that we've helped train or, or help guide along the way, uh, and we're glad to you know to pass on information if we can if people are looking for contractors that that have the right equipment. Have you guys uh, done any uh, physiological studies like what are the mechanisms of survival that suddenly stop a drought and some tolerant species? The question was, have we done any physiology studies looking at, at tolerance of these plants to drought or adaptations, I guess, um, or salinity? And we have done some on specific plants. Uh, Plains bristle grass was one that there was a lot of physiology work done on it uh, by the Beeville station with, with Dr. Oakenpaul when he was there. Um, you know, we haven't really probed into the, 
the exact mechanisms and, and the way a lot of these plants work. Uh, just from the standpoint of, of our goal is, is to be able to establish those native plants and, and provide a seed source of them. So a lot of the actual, any physiology, physiology work we've done has been from a standpoint of seed production. Uh, timing of, of trying to influence flowering, uh, fertilizer regimes, irrigation needs, those, those type things. Um, tend to stay native. Uh, you know, the, that, that is a difficult subject in, in kind of the restoration and, and ecology worlds. Uh, okay, the, the question was about, uh, I guess in essence, using genetic modification to make, make some of these natives better competitors or, or more tolerant of certain conditions. And, you know, the when you deal with native seed sources and native plant restoration, you have a lot of people that that have more of an ecology mindset and a, a purist mindset in a lot of a lot of situations. And then you also have a, the argument of if you breed or genetically modify a native plant, is it native anymore? Um, you know, I, I would say from our program standpoint. Um, if we're able to have success with with naturally evolved selections, you know that's that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, it may take something like that to be able to establish a native species of grass in, say, an old world blue stem dominated environment, because that introduced plant is so much more competitive than our native grasses are. Yeah. Right. You know, and and could be. I mean, I, I think there, there's obviously the ability through breeding and, and genetic change to to probably make some of these things more fit. There may be environments that that they would be very useful in. Uh, I think the danger might be that, if, that you develop something like that in, in the market, for lack of a better word, kind of turns on you. They, they wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't, wouldn't utilize it along with the other material that, that's available to them. You know, and the, the issue of creating or changing a native such that it becomes a problem versus now, you know, basically now there, there's no known history of someone planting a, an adapted native species in an area and it becoming a, a problem. Whereas grasses like old world blue stems, the history is there's an introduction of something new that, that in many cases has not been beneficial to a lot of land uses. So. Now, it may be an un unfounded concern. I mean, at the end of the day, even a modified native would still have natural insect predators that probably limited it. Um, but I, I just don't know that you know, with the, the mindset that's out there in this restoration world, if that would be very well accepted. The, some of the older native seed releases uh, were just their standard cultivar releases. They were many times bred and had some proof of, of superiority to common selections of that plant. And a lot of those commercially have not done well recently. There's fewer, fewer people that want to use those. Uh, and oftentimes they're really not that much different than, than everything else. 
Asking. The, the question was if a, a landowner dealing with oil and gas companies wanted to find information about uh, what kind of damages they would need to, to look for or cost of doing restoration, where would they go to find that? And the easiest uh, and most precise way I would say to do it when it comes to seed would be to just go ahead and get an estimate commercially. Uh, get a seed mix recommendation that which we can, our program can provide and then get an actual cost quote. Uh, we do have some information and, and presentations on our website archived. Recently there was a, a very good document that uh, many natural resource agencies and, and we were involved in. I think it's called Voluntary Best Management, Management Practices for Oil and Gas Activity. And it was put out by Texas Parks and Wildlife. And it, it basically gives a step-by-step you know, -step overview of things to, to be concerned about from a wildlife habitat standpoint when you deal with oil and gas production on a, on a ranch. But the, you know, based on experience, the number that it seems to be a good fit in a lot of places, uh, if you were going to contract out the planning uh, $250 an acre usually gets a pretty good restoration job done. But again, the, you know, we obviously have nothing to do with that, that cost. I mean, that's a real world uh, supply and demand uh, market. So we, you know, I would say your best bet is to go get actual quotes from, from seed companies and contractors and work that into your agreements. And increasingly, uh, particularly pipeline companies, as busy as they are, they're oftentimes coming in and putting a figure of around that range on the table uh, early on. So, well, they, they would almost rather the landowner deal with the revegetation part of it than them. Well, it, it, it becomes difficult for a, say, a pipeline company that's putting in a 25-mile segment of pipeline. If every other landowner wants something a little different, you can see what a challenge that would be. And I think in those cases, it is easier for them to just pay the landowners to have the work done themselves. Uh, you know, that's been one of the sticking points is if you're just planting buffalo grass on that whole 25 miles, it's a lot more straightforward and I guess easier process, but increasingly there's landowners that don't want that. <laughs>